This is going to be Genesis 33. We're going to talk about the fear of Jacob. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him four hundred men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. So Jacob lifted up his eyes. And at that moment he saw what he's been dreading all this time, seeing Esau face to face. That's Jacob's greatest fear right now, seeing his brother face to face. It had been a little over 20 years since the last time that he'd saw Esau. But they left each other on really bad terms. Esau was mad because uh, he had sold Jacob his birthright and mad because Jacob had deceitfully stolen his blessing. But you got to remember that 20 years has passed since all that happened. I mean, are you still mad about the same things that you're mad about 20 years ago? I mean, if Jacob would think, then he would realize, you know, it's been 20 years. Surely his wrath has died down a little bit. But imagine being in Jacob's shoes. Imagine being in Jacob's shoes and you see this big rough looking hunter coming at you with 400 men behind him not only that but you have your wives and children with you and he lifts up his eyes and looked and behold esau came and with him 400 men and he he divided the children unto leah and unto rachel and unto the two handmaids so jacob never did go through with dividing his people up into two groups like he had planned instead he just puts the ones he cares about the most further back it says in verse 2, And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. So he puts the two lesser wives, Zilpah and Bilhah, in the front with their children, then Leah and her children, and then Rachel and Joseph in the very back. Those are the ones who he cared about the most. And you can see how there could be jealousy in the household. I mean, Jacob is plainly showing favoritism here putting Rachel and Joseph in the very back. Seems like he cared much more about them than he did the rest. It says in verse 3, And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So Jacob, at least, he's got the guts to go first here. He goes out there in front of his family, bowing himself to the ground seven times. And Esau's people are probably thinking that this guy's high or something, I mean. Uh, coming out there bowing himself seven times to the ground. And uh, they're probably thinking, you know, who's he trying to suck up to here? But he's just so afraid of Esau. I mean, he's already sent animals to him to go before him and everything else. Sent messengers to go to him and try to appease his wrath. I mean, 20 years has passed, and now he's bowing to him seven times. He's really just trying to make sure that Esau is not going to kill him. But it says in verse 4, And Esau ran to meet him, and embraced him, and fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. So all this time, Jacob's been worried for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Uh, he put all that time and effort into worrying about something that did not even happen. And I've had that happen to me plenty of times. I'll be worried about something all day, and then the time comes for whatever it is to take place. And the thing that I thought the that was going to take place doesn't even happen. And the Bible makes it clear in Philippians 4, 6 to be careful for nothing. That means don't be full of care for stuff. Don't spend so much time just worried about something. In Matthew 6, 4, it says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. You know, don't spend all your time worried about what's going to take place tomorrow because it what you think is going to take place probably is not even going to happen and you're going to spend all your time worrying for nothing. And he, Esau, lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who's, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. So he finally gives God some credit and mentions the Lord here. And he finally comes out and says, You know, I got these from the Lord. And God did give him those children. It says in Psalm 127, 3 through 5, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. 
So, children are from the Lord. Uh, just like Paul says in Galatians, he says that, as it pleased the Lord, it pleased the Lord who separated me from my mother's womb. So, Jacob calls himself Esau's servant. I mean, he's really sucking up here. And I mean, he's still scared. Even with all the things that the Lord's given him, he's given him promises, telling him that he's going to be okay. He, uh, God's the one that told him to go to Bethel in the first place. Um, he's given him angels, two camps of angels, and he's still afraid. It says in verse 6, Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. So now Jacob's whole family is coming to bow down before Esau. I mean, even Joseph has to. All these children coming to bow down before Esau. And they also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near unto Rachel, and they bowed themselves. Remember that Esau is a picture of the flesh, and Jacob is a picture of a worldly Christian. And when the man of the house bows down to the flesh, the rest of his house is probably going to bow down too. It says in Genesis 33, 8, And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. So he's like, Jacob, what's up with all the droves of cattle that you've sent me? You see, they were supposed to appease Esau's wrath so that he wouldn't be so upset with Jacob. He wouldn't be mad at him anymore. But he says in verse 9, And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. Esau didn't even have... Esau didn't even have to have all that. He didn't even want it all. He says, I've got enough. And Jacob said in verse 10, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. So it's like Jacob you know, needs Esau to take those presents to just further assure him that he's not mad at him. Because you know how some people... They're not going to accept a gift from somebody that they're truly mad at. Uh, Jacob wanted him to take it for proof. Jacob was so glad that Esau's countenance had changed toward him that seeing him happy with him was like seeing the face of God. And he says in verse 11, Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. Eventually, Esau took it. And if you keep giving everything you have to the flesh... Esau being a picture of the flesh, you know, the flesh is going to take it. And he said, let us take our journey and let us go and I will go before thee. So Esau is offering to lead Jacob and go before him, to travel before him and everything. And Jacob makes the right choice and turns him down here. In verse 13 it says, And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. So Jacob lets him down easy. He says his children are tender. You know, they're young, and the oldest is probably about 14. They wouldn't be able to keep up, and neither would the flocks and the herds with the young be able to keep up. But Jacob's just using this as an excuse. Jacob said that it would overdrive them and the flock would die. This was an excuse not to go with Esau. He knew he really wasn't supposed to go. He didn't really want to go. Jacob knew he was supposed to go to Bethel, where God told him to go. And he should have just told Esau that God told him to go to Bethel. But Jacob pictures a worldly Christian who doesn't want to tell the world about meeting God. Bethel is where Jacob met God face to face. So he says, you know, instead of telling Esau the truth, he says, you know, Esau, the kids are young. And I'm just going to kind of take it easy, maybe enjoy the scenery on the way, and I'll catch up with you. You know, I just don't want to overdrive them. You know, sometimes you can overdrive your kids and they, they get burnt out. Sometimes you have to take it easier on them. Let them grow up gradually. He says, Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly. So he's like, uh, Esau, you go ahead. Go before your servant. Me, your servant. And I will lead on softly, slowly. According as the cattle that goeth before me and the children, be able to endure until I come unto my Lord and to see her. Jacob is telling Esau a lie. You know, Jacob is, is a deceiver. Remember, his name means supplanter. And he lied to Esau 20 years before this. Things haven't changed. He's telling more lies. He's lying again. 
He's not going to meet Esau and Seir. It says in verse 15, And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, What needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So Esau wants to give Jacob some bodyguards here to hang back and walk with him. But Jacob refuses because he knows that he's not going to see her. Why else would he refuse? I mean, if he was really going to see her, then he would have accepted the offer. Because remember, Jacob is very fearful and would take what he, would, what he can get to protect him. Uh, Jacob does make the right choice in separating from Esau and not letting him go before him. Uh, because Esau is a picture of the flesh, and you don't want to let the flesh lead you. It says in verse 16 and 17, So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir, you know, thinking, you know, Jacob's right behind him. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a an house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. So Jacob, it's obvious he's not going to see her. He went into a completely different direction. Went to Succoth and built him a house. And Succoth means booths. They were like his barns for his cattle. I mean, he was making himself right at home. And keep in mind that he's not going to Bethel either. He stops short of where the Lord wanted him to go. And it's going to come back to bite him later. It says, And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. So this is going to come back and bite Jacob. Uh, he stopped too early. He was supposed to go on to Bethel. Now this picture is a worldly Christian who always stops at the third or fourth best thing instead of going on to what God really wants them to do. He stopped short of where God really wanted him to go. When you know what God wants you to do, don't stop short of it. Just keep going on until you get to it. And he's going to run into some trouble with the men of Shechem in the next chapter because of this bad decision that he made. In Genesis 33:20, it says, And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohi Israel, which pretty much means my God, the God of Israel. Notice he had already built a house, booths, bought some land, and everything else before he finally made the altar. But at least he does make an altar. But this could picture the Christian who doesn't think about God until he's at church on Sunday. I mean, even though Sunday is the first day of the week, in people's minds it's the last day before the start of their work week, which is Monday. And many Christians don't think about God or crack open a Bible until they get to church on Sunday. They go through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Never gave God a thought until they reach to what's in their mind is the last day of the week, Sunday. And then for them, their week starts on Monday. And they never gave God a thought through the week until Sunday. But Jacob, he pictures that worldly Christian. Uh, Jacob pictures a worldly Christian who is intimidated by the flesh and tries to give the flesh everything that it wants to appease it, to comfort it, to caress it, and never make it feel upset because he's he's af afraid of what the flesh can do to him. He's afraid of the flesh being displeased. Uh, don't be a worldly Christian. That's what Jacob pictures.